Good morning to one and all. We invite you to stand as you're able and worship with us this morning.
changes us, it changes what we see. moment to greet one another with signs of love and peace as we take our seats this morning. I'm going to set this here. Well, good morning, one and all. Uh, welcome to Grace United Methodist Church. It is wonderful to be here in worship on this last Sunday in July. You know, I've always thought this about the church. It is the only place in the community where we can go, and every time we go, we get to hear a life-giving word. Amen? Amen? So glad that you are here and hope that your hearts are open to receive God's word today. Um, but let's take a moment to introduce ourselves. My name's Janet Salbert, and I am one of the former pastors here. Really, really happy to be amongst old friends and new friends today, and especially this old friend here. <laughs> I am delighted to be next to my old friend and former pastor as well. Good morning, everyone. I'm Jen Woolard. I'm the chair of our leadership board and the lay leader now, and I add my greetings and welcome to you uh, as Janet did, and welcome to those online, and a special welcome if you're worshiping us with us for the first time, either here in person or online. We're glad that you're here with us in grace uh, this morning. I want to encourage everyone to fill out the Connect card. If you're here in person in worship, there's a QR code on the order of worship in your screen, or there's some paper copies that you can fill out. and bring up and drop in the basket during Living Thanks. If you're online, there should be a QR code up on the screen or a link in the Facebook description of our page that you can uh, fill out. It's a way for us to get to know you and to hear of any prayer requests or other things that you have going on or ways that you want to get involved uh, with the church. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. So as we are heading into worship, let's uh, bow our heads and have an opening prayer. 
Almighty God, the fountain of all wisdom, you know what we need before we ask and when we don't even know what to ask. Have compassion on our weakness and mercifully give us those things which for in our unworthiness we dare not and in our sightlessness we cannot ask. Through the worthiness of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. 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 Uh, well, now uh, we'd like to invite Anna Burrell to come up forward to offer our children's message. So or if you are a child or a child at heart, please come, come along to hear a message for today. very tired. Is anybody else here really tired? Yeah, what about out here? Is anybody really tired? Yes. Do y'all know why I'm so tired? I was up really late last night watching something on TV. It's a big event. It happens every four years. It's going on in Paris. Who knows what I was watching last night? Go ahead and say it. The Olympics. I was watching the Olympics. Have you guys been watching the Olympics? Yeah, you haven't been watching it. That's okay. So what's your favorite Olympic event? Uh, yeah. Track, Maddie. Gymnastics, yeah. Cycling, Susan. Gymnastics, yeah, what's yours? Ice hockey, but we're in the off season. Oh, no, ice hockey. Maybe field hockey then for the Summer Olympics. One of my um, favorite events I was watching yesterday was rugby. Um, I didn't know I was into rugby. I don't know the rules of it, but it was a really fun game to watch. I especially like when they pick them up and like, like they do kind of like a ballet move to like pick them up and catch the ball. Um, so I was watching that and I just thought it was so cool, you know, watching these athletes do some of the most amazing things with their bodies that, I mean, as I'm sitting on the couch eating a pint of Ben and Jerry's, I'm like, I could do that, right? Um, <laughs> do you guys think that you could compete in the Olympics? Yeah. Probably, yeah. Well, there was one thing I noticed um, was in the rugby match. Every time Argentina would score a goal, because America decided not to deliver yesterday, um, every time Argentina would score a goal, one of the guys, he would make the sign of the cross. He would go like that, right? Why do you think he did that? Yeah. Because he felt like God was helping him. That's right. He was giving glory to God as he was doing these amazing things. And that actually comes from our scripture today where it says, Now to him who by the power at work within us is able to accomplish abundantly far more than all we can ask or imagine, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus. Right? So what's that, what that's telling us is that God gives us the ability to do amazing things, just like those athletes, just like Simone Biles is doing, right? Or just like Caleb Dressel or Katie Ledecky. They're doing these amazing things, and when he does that, we are able to give glory to him like they did at the rugby match. So let's pray. Dear God, Thank you for giving us the power to do amazing things. Help us to bring glory to your name. Amen. All right, we're going to talk about some more amazing things over there in Pop Out Church. So let's go over there.
So as Estella and Adelaide James come forward to read scripture, I'll remind you that Pastor Drew shared the book of Ephesians is a book about unity in the church. Um, it's the heart's desire of God for us to be community. And the Apostle Paul writes that every family on earth and in heaven is one with the Father. And the rest of this passage is written as prayer. So let us listen for the word of God this morning. A reading from St. Paul's letter to the Ephesians. Listen for the word of the Lord. For this reason I bow my knees before the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth takes its name. I pray that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant that you may be strengthened in your inner being with power through his spirit, and that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith as you are being rooted and grounded in love. I pray that you may have the power to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth and to know the love of Christ surpasses knowledge so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who by the power at work within us is able to accomplish abundantly far more than all we can ask or imagine. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus, Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. This, this is, is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you. So that's what baptism does, my friends. Um, these young women were baptized in our church, and now they are delivering for us the word of God. Let us take a moment and pray. Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you that your spirit is already moving amongst us, and we thank you for the way that your love and grace is pouring into this day. We ask your blessing upon us all that we may be moved to further know how deep and long and great is your love for us and for the world. Amen. So, some of you may know that I am the mother of four sons. Yes, four. And I always said that the only thing better than three sons was four. <laughs> but come on, God really does give you more than you can handle. <laughs> Among our son's childhood experiences were visiting the caves that run up and down the Blue Ridge Mountains. Spelunking was quickly added to their weekend vocabulary, and it's always interesting to me how ordinary the exterior of a cave looks. In fact, there's nothing special about the rocks or the trees or the bushes that are around a cave. In fact, if you didn't know the cave was there, most of us would walk by and totally miss it. Caves are dark inside, and once inside, if you don't have any light, our imaginations take hold and we imagine an ogre or some wild animal ready to uh, devour us. Uh, sometimes you have to squeeze through the tiniest of places in order to get into the depths of the cave. But once given a bit of artificial light, you can see all kinds of amazing structures. These are limestone formations, stalagmites and stalactites. No Greek words today. <laughs> They're sometimes arranged in curtains, and they often turn underground earthen rooms into cathedral-like dwellings. These formations are created through many years of constant dripping of minerals, 
forming much like icicles do off of our roofs in the wintertime. This one is called the Witch's Finger, and it's in Carlsbad Caverns, and it rises like a tower from the floor of the cave. Pretty incredible, huh? Similar to the exterior of a cave, on the outside, we humans look pretty ordinary most of the time, too. And most of the time, we pass by one another without a thought. There's no way to know from the outside what is going on the inside. Look around this sanctuary. We all look like pretty average, ordinary people. Yet some of us haven't slept last night because of the Olympics. <laughs> some of us haven't slept last night because of an illness or conflict in the family or grief that keeps us awake. Some of us can't afford to pay the bills. Some of us find that we have hard work waiting for us this week, and it keeps us on edge. When God revealed God's heart for us, God sent his son to live and dwell amongst us. And it is not lost on me that Jesus was born in a cave. Caves were the stables for the ancients, where shelter could be found during the heat of the day or long, dark nights. So a cave was known for being a place of safety. When Milton and I, and along with a group from Grace, were in Israel a couple of summers ago, we visited the Church of the Nativity. This is a sanctuary that is built around the cave where it is believed that Jesus came into the world. And although it was a summer day in August and quite hot, we sang Silent Night here in this cave. And here is where you can bow in prayer and touch the stone where the baby Jesus lay. So in this part of the letter to the church at Ephesus, this prayer suggests that it is what we have on the inside that makes all the difference for what is revealed on the outside. What is in the cave of your heart? What emerges out of your depths first? Anxiety, sadness, fear, maybe compassion or gratitude. Just take a moment and look into your heart. St. Ignatius of Loyola was known for his work in guiding people like us in examining the interior life. And because of the work of, the, of Christ, from the cross to the empty tomb, there is no judgment with what we find in our hearts, no judgment with what is in our interior lives. Because, my friends, we are forgiven before we even fail or fall. All of it, the stalagmites and the stalactites, they're okay. The beauty and the kindness that you find in your heart, it's okay. Along with the shadows and the curtains, the fear and the bitterness you find is okay. Everything in the cave of your heart belongs there. All that is necessary is that we be honest with what we find. Because the cave of our heart is the very place where the love of Christ is born again and again and again. A love that the Apostle Paul writes is deeper and wider and longer. A love that fills us to move beyond ourselves. So let us take a moment and explore our hearts for a moment. Maybe even listen for a silent night that takes place in our hearts, a place where Jesus is born.
You see, it seems we are always looking for peace and contentment outside of ourselves. The right job, better health, the right relationship, the right house, maybe winning the right medal, perfectly behaved children and youth. Even in our God-seeking, even when we're looking for God, we expect God to be found somewhere beyond ourselves. And my friends, this is true. God is found over and above us and beyond our knowing. But because of Christ, God is also deep within us and also beyond our knowing. Exploring our interior lives might be just the place where we find Christ dwelling in our hearts away from ordinary sight. And the best way to get things right in our outer life is to deal with our inner lives first. I think this is exactly what Jesus meant when he said, the kingdom of God is within you. The kingdom of God is within you. If we begin praying this prayer, this prayer from the third chapter of Ephesians and pray that we might be strengthened in our inner being by the Spirit to know the length and breadth and height and depth of the love of God, it says for all the saints, the love for everyone. That is us, that is we, the church. We, the church, then, are called to something bigger, an abundance beyond our imagining. You see, the inner work of our hearts and souls is what reveals the love of God for others. The inner work is not a contest to see who can be more pious or prayerful. It is the hard work of humbly accepting ourselves, the good stuff and the limitations just to accept ourselves as we are and to know that God loves us and that God is using us. This prayer is the kind of prayer that requires the balance of quiet meditation, yes, and also confident action. For the sign of spiritual maturity is not how good our prayers are, but the actions that come through those prayers. So here's the thing. What good is God's love if it's an isolated event, if it's only for our personal use when we need a spiritual fix? What good is a cave if it's not explored and the treasures revealed for all? James Baldwin was a contemplative. He was also an African-American civil rights activist he lived during a tumultuous time in our country, and he insisted that love is the work of community. And I quote Baldwin here, the longer I live, the more deeply I learn that love is the work of mirroring and magnifying each other's light. Now imagine that in a time when there was so much rejection, so much racism, and James Baldwin understood that love finds light in every person. This last week in the New York Times, there was an article about Betty Gordon. And given all the political news and excitement in Paris, you might have missed it. Betty Gordon moved to New York um, from Detroit in the 1950s, and she lived a Typical bohemian life, imagine that in Soho in Greenwich Village, right? An aspiring actress who explored all the New York nightclubs and nearby resorts. She even dated the renowned undercover cop Serpico, oftentimes walking dogs with him and going to the ballet. Later, Betty became the proprietor of a saloon in Greenwich Village. And it was there that she befriended a young artist who took jobs at her saloon working behind the bar. And they enjoyed a friendship based on theater and film and literature. Well, 15 years after closing the saloon, she remained close friends with those who frequented this bar, including 
the young artist whose name is Ian. In her 90s, Betty was not in good health, and she had begun selling her acquired possessions in order to pay her bills. You might think that she was in need of help herself, but rather, Ian, who was suffering from a long-term addiction, began texting his friend at three and four in the morning. His anxiety was so high he could not focus to work, much less produce any art. Betty, who had appreciated his artistic skill, asked him, if I write a book, will you illustrate it? <laughs> Betty wanted to find a way to help Ian and bring him out of this downward spiral. Well, Betty, who was now 93, had never written a book. <laughs> and together, they published a children's book. I have it here. Phoebe the Cat. Phoebe the Cat is a cute little book about a cat who's trying to figure out exactly her spot in the world. And this, this story tends to have a lot of themes from her bohemian era, so I'm not sure how much of it is really a children's story. <laughs> but um, Ian agreed to do the editing and the illustrating. And there are fabulous illustrations the whole way through this book. Um, what Betty found in helping her friend and sharing the love that was inside her heart, that in an unintended way, her life was revitalized as well. Phoebe the Cat is an imaginative story, but what is best about this book is how it came to be. In the words of James Baldwin, love is the work of mirroring and magnifying another's light. Even now, for us, with all the world's complexities, when we still don't have answers to the questions that we ask, we, the church, have all we need. Because of Christ, the Spirit strengthens our inner being through the love of God with love's boundless and endless and abundance there is light to be found in the cave of every heart. On the shores of the Dead Sea lie several more caves, places of safety. And for the Qumran community, these caves were most likely places of worship, places where life was given, places where life was preserved, where the love of God was born again and again in the hearts of the faithful, creating a community whose gift to the world was to preserve the sacred word of God. For here in the 1960s, almost the entirety of the Hebrew Bible was found evidenced amongst the fabric, the fragments they found at the Dead Sea Scrolls. Um, pop quiz, two points for anyone who knows the two books that weren't included in those scrolls. Esther and Nehemiah were not found, but every other book in the Hebrew Bible was found amongst the Dead Sea Scrolls. On the day that our group from Grace visited the site there at the Dead Sea, the cave was not empty. And in the cave, sheltered from the sun and heat, was a lost goat. And I guess you can't see him too well, but that little goat is in that cave. You see, we don't always have a choice what comes to dwell in the cave of our hearts either. But if we explore our hearts, we will find that even when we are lost or suffering, the Spirit will give us what we need to be safe and to have peace. What I like best about Betty and Ian's new book is how it came to be. But what I like best about our book, about the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ, is how it came to be. God sent his son so that we might have the power to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of God found in Christ Jesus who by the power of the Holy Spirit lives within 
dwells in our hearts and amongst us all. Amen. So let's take a few moments as a whole community, exploring the cave of our hearts, allowing ourselves to be held by the love of God right here and right now. If you wish to come forward and spend some time at the altar, please do. The offering baskets are in the front as well. You may also just simply remain seated and soak in God's grace. May our prayer, our prayer, be for our inner lives, that our deepest hope in our inner lives might be to mirror the light of God's love for all those around us, for the world today. Amen.
So in our time of prayer this morning, um, there are a few things probably on all of our hearts, uh, peace in the Middle East being one of them. Our pastors are away spending time with their family and how good is that to be a church um, that cares for their pastors and make sure that they are able to grow in the love that they share with their families. Um, a special prayer for those folks who are incarcerated. Um, we don't often raise that up as a need of prayer, but it is a need of prayer. Our prisons are full and um, we need to remember those. And also a special prayer for the Schillinger family um, right now as they are dealing with uh, Bill's illness and just prayers. Uh, Bill's been such a big part of our music program here and so we remember him today. But for those of you who are in the sanctuary and those of you who are online, I'm going to invite you to a posture of prayer because prayer is also about using our bodies. So I want you to take your dominant hand, whichever hand that is, whether you're right or left-handed, and I want you to envision that your hand is the heart of God. And now take your non-dominant hand and place your, that's your heart, place your heart into God's heart as we pray. Let us pray. Good and gracious God, we thank you for filling us with your word, a word that is life-giving, a word that gives us a place of safety and security, a word that allows us to look at ourselves and realize your forgiveness, to understand the goodness in our hearts as well as the limitations. We thank you for all the ways you nurture our hearts and souls, especially the way that our young members of this congregation were able to share the word of God with us today, nurturing us to grow. We pray for the lonely and the lost, for those who are incarcerated. We also pray for victims. We pray for all those families who are grieving losses of loved ones. And on this day, we continue to lift up the leaders of communities all around our world, the leaders of nations. We trust in your healing grace this day for all those who are receiving medical care, for all those in need of healing in their relationships. We take this moment of silence to lift those up to you. Increase in us the courage to be people of compassion, to be a whole church of compassion, to address what is broken amongst us so that we can help relieve the hurts of others and restore our families and our communities. We thank you this day for the immeasurable love of God in Christ, who taught us all to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in, in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now, when you are ready, you might take your heart and open it that your heart might also hold God's heart. Amen. Amen. All right, we close out our worship service this day with this worship song, Joy of the Lord, Let Us Sing for Joy. Though the tears may fall, my song will rise, my song will rise to you. 
Though my heart may fail, my song will rise, my song will rise to you. While there's breath in my lungs, I will praise you, Lord. In the dead of night, I lift my eyes, I lift my eyes to you. When the waters rise, I lift my eyes, I lift my eyes to you. While there's hope in this heart, I will praise you, Lord. There's joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy. strength indeed. It has been a joy to be in worship with you. Will you all join me in thanking our awesome Thrive musicians for leading us in worship today. There's a number of ways you can stay engaged with Grace and the Grace community during the coming week. We want to lift up a few of those to you today and the first one happens this afternoon. So some of you may know and may have participated. We're having regular fun gatherings during the summer as another way that we can be together in community out in the community. This afternoon, come out and hang out down with your church friends at Harris Pavilion at three o'clock. The Navy Commodores Band are giving a concert. We're gonna be there, bring your chairs, come. We can hang out as a group and enjoy some more incredible music and fellowship time together. The second way comes next Sunday, uh, August 4th for Church Chat. Next Sunday, Pastor Drew is gonna lead a casual chat at the Good Shepherd window right out here in the narthex. 
at 12 p.m. for anybody who wants to have questions answered, wants to hear updates on the church or anything that you want. I'll be joining Pastor Drew and hopefully we'll see some of you there as well, as well for some casual conversation about what's been happening at Grace these days. Oh, great, lots of good things coming up. Now this sounds like this might be a long way off, um, but for those of you considering new members, please put this on your calendar. August 26th, there's a Zoom meeting at seven o'clock. You will see links to how to register for that on your email. Um, so if you don't have email, please sign up for our email as well. Um, but that new member class is about 90 minutes and it's a great way to get to know other new folks that are joining the church and to start to hear some of the stories of our congregation. So I hope you'll sign up for that. And then in September, I'm going to be leading a book study titled Addiction and Grace. This is a book that was written by the late Christian psychiatrist, Gerald May. And it starts by admitting that we, um, attachment is an important part of our human nature. And attachment sometimes grows into addiction. And in fact, if we think about it, we're all addicted, right? And so this is a class to come and look at and see how does addiction intersect with the freedom that God gives us to receive God's grace. So um, seven weeks of study, and you'll find information about this in the email. And again, would like to um, have you register for that as well. So uh, thank you all for being online and worshiping with us this morning. Uh, thank you all for um, bringing your hearts to uh, worship today. This is what we do together uh, to grow and receive God's word. And so let us go from this place in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Let us carry the love of God out and reveal it in the world for others. Amen. Amen. The joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy